Hello, 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 hello everyone. And welcome to the second episode of Survivor Strong, a podcast for survivors of childhood trauma. I'm author, certified life coach and survivor, Yvonne Sandemir. This is where we'll talk about all things related to childhood trauma um, with a particular emphasis on child sexual abuse and incest. If you are joining us for the first time from the Los Angeles Times Vessel with Books, welcome. I was so happy to meet all of you. Um, I so appreciate, appreciate all of you that stopped by to say hello to me and to share your, your stories of courage and survival. Um, I can't tell you how much it meant to me. Um, so thank you so much for stopping by. Um, you know, I really, really want to connect with some of the people that um, that did stop by and see me. I mean, well, really, I'd like to see all of them, to be honest with you. But a few of them really, you know, stuck with me. Um, Thomas, Sandra, Michael, Dina, Carrie, and so many others. Um, if you're watching, let me know because I would love to get you in here and to talk to you about um, your story and how you got to where you are today. So our guest today will be Deanna Salas Freeman. Um, she'll be joining us a little bit later in the show. Um, so right now, I think I just wanna start by telling you a little bit more about myself because I realized that um, my first episode, there was so much information <laughs> that I wanted to give you that I kind of um, skipped over the part about who I am and why it is that I choose to do what I'm doing. Um, so I really just kind of wanted to start from there. Um, my healing journey began in 2015. Um, it actually began months, literally months after I married the love of my life. Um, when I met my husband um, in 2012, I had a successful sales career um, and was co-parenting two young daughters with my ex-husband, whom fortunately um, we've always been able to set our personal feelings aside for our girls and do what's in their best interest. Um, and we do so to this very day. The girls are now 20 and 17. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm very grateful for that. But like many other people, um, I did try to brush my trauma under the rug like everyone else. and. Um, but as I grew closer to my husband, I felt safer to confront the past. And the past came for me like it was looking for a fight, let me tell you. And, you know, it came with severe depression, anxiety, new self-harming behaviors, and suicidal ideation. And thankfully, my husband afforded me the space and time I needed to heal. And that's the journey I began in 2015. And I can't begin to tell you how important it is to have a support system around you, someone who you can always count on, someone who you can turn to when you're feeling down, someone who will just listen to you, not judge, not um, try to offer any advice, but just be there and really hear what it is that is going on. And I know that for me, there was so much that it was difficult to even to even describe or or to make any sense of whatsoever. And that's why healing can be really difficult because, it's complex. It involves very um, complex emotion, emotion that we believe is caused by one thing is really caused by something that happened in our childhood. And until we can identify those things and really learn to heal from them, they will really hold you back. And, you know, that's not what we're trying to do here. You know, we want to grow and every survivor deserves that. And I will repeat that probably every single episode. So 
<laughs> you know, if you think that you're only going to hear that once, think again. You know, I, it's just so important. And I just want to be here and offer this space for other survivors to, if you don't have someone to talk to, that you can come on here and you can interact with, with me and interact with all of the other viewers here. Um, and you'll find a very supportive and encouraging environment. And that's, that's an atmosphere that all survivors need in order to heal and grow. So if you have that support system in your life, you're very lucky and really turn to them and lean on them when you need to. If you don't have a support system in your life, now you do. <laughs> That's me. Um, of course, I can't be in your life every day. I can't, you know, you know, be a phone call away or a text away or an email away. However, you can come here once a week and we can chat and we can talk about what it is that is bothering you. What's weighing you down? What is it that you've been holding in that you just can't hold in anymore. Let me be that person for you. So that's really why I started this journey because I wanted to be an inspiration and a hope for other survivors to know that there is life after trauma and that we do survive. We can heal and we can become productive members of the society, which is really what we all want. Um, and we all can achieve that. So, you know, after starting my journey uh, in 2015, in 2015, um, now over about a span of seven years, um, I've achieved things that my younger self, little Eve, dreamed of for years. That little girl never gave up hope. That little girl believed in her dream and she kept at it until she achieved it. And I'm so proud of that. And I think that, um, I think my inner child would be very proud. I would say that little Eve is very proud of me because I'm proud of myself. I mean, now I'm a certified life coach traveling the country, advocating for children and survivors. And I'm sitting here talking with you and there really isn't any other place I'd rather be right now. And that, you know, this is, a, this is new for all of us. You know, this is a new journey that I'm taking on with this podcast. And so it will take time to build our community and our audience and a really um, dynamic group of people that, uh, that can really offer a lot of advice when needed. Um, I don't think that you need to be a therapist to offer advice. You don't need a therapist to be empathetic or caring or show compassion to some other, to someone else. You have that in you. And, you know, it's often I want to, you know, I wonder what is your inner child carrying? What did your little self dream about as a child? And are you, are you still working toward that goal or have you achieved it? I want to talk about it. You know, um, during these broadcasts, um, what's very wonderful about this is it's an interactive platform the first of its kind where you can interact with me live at any time um, via uh, joining the stage here on Fireside or through comments on Facebook. Um, I am casting live there today as well. Um, at least I believe I am and hopefully um, that's working out like I like I think it is. <laughs> so if you're not, if you don't see me live on Facebook, you got to let me know <laughs> because I think that I am. <laughs> so, you know, I just, I just think about healing and, you know, I think about, think about how heavy 
a burden trauma is. And, you know, think about it. I, I thought that I had been carrying the burden of my past as an adult. I thought I had been carrying it. But the reality is it's been little Eve that's been carrying it all this time. And she's been in here saying, I'm in here. I want to be freed. I want to grow up. I want to experience life. I don't want to be trapped here anymore. And I hope that's the gift that I've given her. I hope that she feels free and she does feel like she's achieved that. You know, something that I think is also very important when healing from trauma is you have to find the humor in it. <laughs> you have to find things that, you know, think of all the things that you laugh at so hard and you laugh so hard because you say, oh my God, that's so true. That's so funny because it's true, right? I mean, there's laughter and truth. Truth is funny, whether it's, you know, bad things, good things. Truth is truth is truth is truth, in my opinion. And there's, and there's humor in everything. You know, to give you an example, okay, like, I'm going to laugh just thinking about it. When abuser, abusers, excuse me, when abusers accuse you of ruining their reputation <laughs> for telling people what they did to you, I'm sorry, but that kind of shit makes me laugh. <laughs> It's like <laughs> the nerve of these people, you know, it's like, wow, you really have the nerve to say that, really? And you just have to laugh at it. It's like, oh, okay, I'm the bad guy here. Okay, yeah, right, whatever. Yeah, there's healing and humor. You know, it makes us more resilient and helps us release negative energy. I mean, Laugh at the nonsense. Don't get pulled into it. Laugh at it. Don't get pulled into it. I had to repeat that because I think it's important. You know, while I was at the, uh, at the festival, I had many great conversations. Um, but one in particular really stood out to me. I had a wonderful conversation with a man who was telling me that he was afraid to plant pink flowers in his front yard because of what people might think of him. Can you imagine being judged by the color of your flowers in your front yard? Pink flowers of all that? Pink flowers? They're flowers. They come in all colors. <laughs> it's like, what, what are you, what's wrong with that? <laughs> he and I laughed so hard because it was pure nonsense. There's absolutely no reason why a man can't plant pink flowers in their front yard, whether, whether they're homosexual or straight, whatever. It doesn't matter. Flowers are flowers are flowers. And I'm sorry, pink is a pretty color, whether you're a guy or a girl. And we were laughing because it's like, we really need to change these, uh, <laughs> these, you know, gender specific, very gender specific things, such as the color pink or the color blue, because they're just colors. And I think that we're really labeling kids, you know, based on what they're wearing and what they really enjoy as a kid. I mean, my nephew, whom I love dearly, he, he loves the color pink. He loves it. His mother and father are wonderful. They buy him pink whatever he wants because they realize that their child just likes the color pink. And liking that color isn't going to mean that their son is going to grow up to be gay. And even if he does, so what? So I absolutely love that about 
my sister-in-law and brother-in-law, the way that they raise their children, because it's so important, you know, and something else too, you know, you talk about, we talked about how, you know, when boys are young, you know, they're like, no, 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 don't give that, don't give that boy a baby doll. He might turn out gay. And I laugh so hard because <laughs> really, I think there's a better chance that the child's going to grow up and learn how to be a better parent, a better father. <laughs> Let him learn how to be loving and nurturing and affectionate. There's nothing wrong with wanting to cuddle a baby or play imagination with Barbie dolls or any other toy for that matter. You know, it just, it doesn't make, it's not gonna make a boy gay any more than if your daughter likes to play with cars and trucks. Does that mean she's going to grow up and be gay? No, of course not. Has anybody ever heard of freaking Danica Patrick? I think that's her name. Um, or Kirkpatrick, Danica Kirkpatrick. Anyway, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I mean, women are allowed to be into things that guys like without being labeled as tomboys or um, masculine or butch or lesbian, whatever, whatever these titles are. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, this whole notion of gender specific toys is nonsense. And so you really have to learn how to laugh at the nonsense and it's okay to laugh at it you know imagine imagine um you know being a little boy and being criticized by your parents because you um enjoyed playing with dolls and you know they they call you sissy you know you're not a sissy because you like to play with dolls you know um it's just it's ridiculous. And, and sometimes where I find the humor is these same people that seem to have these very strong opinions about these things are typically abusers or um, someone that may have even harmed you themselves. So, you know, yes, it's infuriating, but it's also hilarious, right? Like, who are you to tell me about anything about what I do after what you did? And, you know, I see a couple of people just joined us. Hello. Thank you so much for joining, joining me. Um, you know, we're just talking about how hilarious it is, um, you know, some of these stereotypes. And I'll go back just a little bit since you just joined me. Um, I had a great conversation with a man at the Los Angeles Times Festival, Festival of Books over the weekend. Um, he told me that he was, in fact, a gay man. Um, but as a man, he was terrified to plant pink flowers in his front yard because he was afraid of what his dad would think, what his family would think, what other people would think. Can you imagine flowers, pink flowers? And we just laughed so hard because it was pure nonsense. And even though it was painful at the time, painful um, for him, you know, to have to deal with that judgment. And we don't want to laugh at that pain because that is not funny, obviously. But just, you know, it's flowers. It's pink flowers. Or when we talk about giving boys dolls and, you know, how some people are afraid if you give a boy a doll that they'll they'll turn out gay and, you know, we laugh that, no, it might just make them a better father when they grow up, you know? <laughs> I just think that it's important that, um, you know, that we find the humor wherever we can and to know that if we do have people in our lives that think this way, that that's okay, because that's them. Um, but the point is their perception of you doesn't have to be your reality. 
instead of taking all that negative, negative energy in, laugh it out, laugh it out. You know, I also think that it's important to laugh at ourselves too. I mean, for example, now I'm going to tell you, this is a little bit embarrassing for me, but I'm going to share for you. I'm going to share it with you. Okay. For example, in the middle of a repetition compulsion, okay, I, which is something that I struggle with, which we'll talk about more in detail later in future episodes, but basically it's just where I put myself in situations where it's high risk and I could get myself in trouble for whatever reason. So in one of these cycles, this repetition compulsion cycles, I was seriously considering buying a house, a whole house. <laughs> For the sole purpose of having a friend live there, practically rent-free. Now, think about this for a second. <laughs> I'm thinking I'm going to buy this house. You know, they can live there rent-free. That solves their problem, right? What about me <laughs> now? I have to pay for all of this. And, and as I was going through the process... I realized I'm about to drop tens of thousands of dollars that I don't have on a property simply because someone I know needed a place to stay. Like, what in the hell was I thinking, right? Like, who does that? And fortunately, none of the properties, you know, went went through. So that ended with the... Uh, you know, I left that situation unscathed, basically, <laughs> fortunately. Um, but, you know, I feel like it was the universe saying to me, girl, nope, we're not, <laughs> that's not happening today. <laughs> You're not doing that. You know, but instead of beating myself up for going through, even going through the process of having a realtor show me properties and I put in several offers and contracts and I did inspections on a couple of places, instead of beating myself up for the quote unquote wasted money, I just laughed at it because I laugh at myself and I laugh and I say, you know what, little Eve, my inner child, Apparently she was she was, she was a, a millionaire when she was a little girl and fortunate and you know that's not the case right now <laughs> maybe one day but not yet <laughs> yeah. you know so it's just uh, you know so you just have to laugh at it so you know I want to give some things to, to jump in here and and you know tell me what's something that you can laugh about um, from your trauma does anyone want to jump in here and. You know, oh, now everybody left because I asked them to jump in. That's hilarious. <laughs> okay, Woody's back. Woody, you're back here. Hi, would you like to join us on stage and tell us a little bit about yourself? What if I tap on you and I can invite you? We'll see if you want to, if you want to join. I'm going to invite you to speak. And you let me know. And you could come on video too if you want. But literally, <laughs> when I invited you all to come on the stage, like literally everybody at the same time left. <laughs> so it doesn't look like Woody's going to take me up on my offer just yet. We'll give him a little bit of time. <laughs> How about that, Woody? You want to jump in here and... Uh, and join us. I'll invite you to video this time. Maybe you want to be on video like me. Or not. That's okay, too. We have plenty of time. <laughs> so, so anyway, going back to what I was saying, you know, it's just, we have to, you know, it's ridiculous. You know, the, the conversation about the flowers, you know, it was a wonderful conversation and I just can't imagine being judged by the color of flowers. I mean, it's just crazy to me, you know, and we just laughed for so long and, you know, just one more thought about giving boys baby dolls for a toy, you know, it's okay for boys just to show love, affection and care for another human being or want to express love with a doll and not just foster the idea that, 
men should only show love and affection to women when it's time to procreate. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? <laughs> just more ridiculousness we, that we just have to laugh at. You know, but while we're laughing at it, you know, we should also, you know, speak up for change and try to be an agent of change for these things and, and not perpetuate it continuing on with our children and grandchildren and so on and, and so forth. So, you know, as I said before, you know, nobody's perception of you is your reality. And instead of taking in negative energy, laugh it all out, laugh it out. So, um, so those are some things that I, you know, that I think about when I get into laughing at trauma. And my my guest today, Deanna Sellis Freeman, um, she may not be able to join us after all due to a conflict with a um, an event with a family member, which I completely, completely understand. Um, and so I'm just going to continue on and, and until she shows up, maybe she will. And if she does, yay, we'll continue. And if not, we'll, we'll end at 8, 8 p.m. And then we'll, we'll do this all over again next week um, on Wednesday. So, you know, <clears throat> I know sometimes it, it can be hard to find the humor. You know, I mean, a lot of people think that, um, you know, therapy is all doom and gloom. And it's actually not at all. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are difficult times and when, you know, you don't want to be there, but there are also so many wonderful, uplifting, oh, just positive moments that are really worth all of the, the difficulties. Um, and, and I think that's why so many survivors are hesitant to you know, start that process. They fear all of the bad emotions and negativity that's going to come back, which it will, but it's not, it's not all doom and gloom. And I'm just very, very happy about that. And I see that Judy just joined us. Hi, Judy. Thank you for joining us. We are just talking about laughter after trauma and finding laughter in the humor um, and humor in trauma. Um, and so Judy, I was telling uh, everyone else the, uh, an example of um, a wonderful conversation that I had with someone about, you know, planting pink flowers and how um, he was terrified to, to plant pink flowers because of what people might think of him and and just how the nonsense surrounding that made the situation so funny that, you know, at the end, I think he said that he was going to go plant a whole yard full, which I hope he does. <laughs> I hope he does. Um, so, Judy, would you like to join us here on stage as a speaker and tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm going to invite you. And you have the option to do video or just speaking. So I'm just gonna invite you as a speaker to begin. And then we will see if, um, if Judy would like to come on and join us. What do you think, Judy? I'm so happy to have you here. It's so nice to chat with you. Yes, wonderful. So Judy, can you um, just spend a little bit of time telling um, everyone a little bit about you and your journey?
Mm. Yes, indeed. Absolutely, you weren't the bad one. And can I ask you a question? Did you feel like the bad one because you were being told you were the bad one? Hmm. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, you know, you saying that it kind of brought something to my mind. Um, you saying that you think it's possible they could have had a normal childhood because yours was so difficult. Um, and it is very possible for siblings to have very different experiences growing up. Very. Yes. Oh, I agree. I agree. And how you said you were one of six. Okay, you were the oldest. So you feel like they were harder on you because you were the oldest. They expected more from you. So it sounds like you really took on um, a parent role with these children and because of how you were treated as a child that you tend to um, find yourself in trauma bonding rel relationships where um, people basically treat you the same way that your parents did or their clarity. So they were hiding. Oh, that's so difficult. And let me tell you, I can totally relate to that. Um, my dad was also a raging alcoholic. He was physically abusive towards my mom um, and my older brother, but not so much me. He wasn't physically abusive towards me. Um, but it was interesting to me because outside of the home, he was top salesperson at his job. He had, you know, he was winning awards. He was, you know, respected and he was being invited on, you know, company dinners. And while all of this is going on, no one knew that when he came home, he would beat my mom to a bloody pulp. And instead of feeding the kids, you know, we had nothing. He had his alcohol. Um, we would go hungry. And so I can totally relate to the frustration of people not seeing someone for who they really are. And you probably had to deal with a lot of people defending them and that is infuriating. <laughs> and I just want to say that I want you to know that even though you don't or didn't have that support from those people around you, even though 
those people defended him, justified, minimized, or whatever they did, it does not change your experience and does not change your truth. And instead of taking in all of that negativity, like I was saying earlier, you know, let's try to find, let's try to find the humor in it if we can. Are you willing to try to do that with me? Okay, let's try to find some humor. So, you know, you're a kid and, you know, you're the older kid and you're supposed to do everything. I mean, so tell me what, it, you know, give me a situation that was just completely ridiculous. Like looking back now, you're like, that situation was completely ridiculous. <laughs> well, I'm so glad that when she came out, she wasn't angry at you. <laughs> and, you know, and if she even if she had come out angry, you know, one way to look at it is, well, hey, you, you cleaned the floor for her, you know. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, there's there's laughter and, and seemingly, you know, negative experiences and then there's the laughter from those those little positive experiences that we have to hold on to and and use those too to heal right and so where are you now in your process where would you say you are uh, oh, yay <laughs> That's really good. And may I ask if you're in therapy on a regular basis? Oh, good. How often do you go? Oh, perfect. Okay, good. And you have a good relationship. You feel comfortable with your therapist. Good. That is so important. Absolutely. And can you share a little bit about, um, you know, how did you start the process? How did you find your therapist? Oh my goodness. Oh. oh my gosh, I can understand that. Can I just take a moment? I want to take a moment for your son. Can you tell me what is his name? Nicholas. And how old is Nicholas? Oh, wow. That's young. That's young for that type of diagnosis. Well, I guess it's not 
I guess it's not, I guess, to anybody, it can anybody, right? And what things, what kind of things did Nicholas like to do? What were some of his hobbies? Oh my gosh, really? He made a huge impact, right? He was good. Oh my gosh, you are so welcome. You are so welcome. I think it's important, you know, we've got to take moments for those special people that we've lost. And, you know, just because they're lost doesn't mean that they're gone forever. And doesn't mean that we can't talk about them and smile about their memory and all of the wonderful things that he achieved while he was here. And um, you know that he's watching over you. He's with you all the time. Yeah, I do too. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for taking a moment to hop on here and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your story. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to discuss while you're here? my pleasure and hopefully you'll join me again um because you know this is what it is it's uh this is what we do every week we're gonna have conversations and you know judy if you're the only one that wants to come on here and have a conversation with me every week guess what <laughs> that's what we're gonna do so um i'm just so happy to, to have had you here and you know i want to thank everyone else that uh, that did pop in Thank you for popping in and thank you for watching. If you're watching on Facebook or wherever you are, um, I believe that there are going to be, um, you can post comments on Facebook and after the broadcast, I'll do my um, post-show posts. I think that's what we decided to call it last time <laughs> where I'll answer questions, et cetera. Um, so with that, I think um, I'll end today's um, session, today's episode. Um, and, you know, I just want to end it on a positive note. Um, today was a beautiful day. Um, I know that um, so many people that I met over the weekend um, and people that I've met over Facebook, um, I want you all to know that you've really made an impact on my life. And you're a part of me now, whether you know it or not. And just know whatever you're going through, I am there with you in spirit. And I am always here on Wednesdays at 7 o'clock Eastern Standard Time to, to talk about whatever it is that is on your heart, what's on your mind, you know, what's something that you're struggling with. So um, with that, I want to thank you all for coming. And um, we will see you again next week at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And remember, we're all in this together, okay? Until next time, everyone. <laughs>